Yeah, can I have a good arg out of her? Arg. We got to get in the mood here, because as they say, uh, the trouble began, begins when you go ashore, if you're a sailor. But if you're a pirate, you just want to keep sailing, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> pardon. Well, anyway, I hope all of you and your suite are hiding your loot after this long trip, and you're going to make it home with your with your with your booty intact. And uh, it's been a remarkable cruise. I got on in Tahiti, of course, and then I extended on to here. And so I've uh, been ruining the days at sea here. And uh, because we had just one more for fun, I dug in my wooden leg and uh, prepared this uh, uh, presentation because uh, piracy is actually one of my uh, professional interests because I still have an active merchant marine license to work with the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Navy as a um, certified marine security officer studying terrorism and piracy especially. And this is uh, a, a long-time phenomena in uh, humanity, Roman law, called the pirates, the hostis humanus geneti, the enemy of all humanity. And Cicero wrote that piracy is more than the sum of its crimes. And even Julius Caesar was captured by pirates off of Sicily in 75 BC. And according to Plutarch, uh, Caesar, when his ship was boarded and seized by pirates. He says, you do not know who you captured. But he was in, under the pirate lair in Sicily for 38 days until he played cards and games with them and promised them that he would pay them more if he let them go, which they did stupidly because he came back with his navy, captured them all, and crucified all of them on the beach. Well, that's the, that's the bad old days. And I'll you know, talk a bit about the, um, let's say, the classic era of piracy and the problems and also that it goes on uh, these days. And I, you know, I, I have uh, many uh, hats and costumes to wear and when I go undercover uh, to research these things, I usually dress like this. Just so I mix in with the crowd at the bar and all of that, you know, you wouldn't want to look too official. And I have been an advisor to different federal agencies and, um, and in particular I uh, uh, many years ago, I had business with our President Donald Trump, and I've been advising him on some issues, and I recently got this, this letter back from him, uh, which you can read thanking me for my suggestions. And uh, at the time, I worked many years in Asia, China, and, and uh, larger Asia, so I was advising on some of that policy. But now I uh, have recently put a proposal to him that he helped the problems of the old Caribbean and especially that pirate lair called Cuba. And I've been there and sailed around it quite a bit, but I, just for your interest, I, I recommended that the Trump administration should make a deal with the Cuban government to open up the economy and the trade and the embargo, allow free trade and all of travel. Uh, but the chip on the table should be something that would be, make a deal with them. And above all, the thorn in the side at the southern coast of Cuba is Guantanamo which I recommended that he offer to give back to the Cuban government, close the prison, send the aged terrorists home, and give it back to the Cuban government on the basis that it would not be a military base, it might be a nice golf resort. Well, I'm waiting for an answer. He has other things to worry about these days. But of course, the Caribbean was the seat of all of this piracy at the age of exploration, colonization started, and so the Spanish main was all of the land masses and the islands in the middle of the Caribbean were plagued by pirates. And so this is the, um, the legacy of the Romantic era of piracy in the Americas, at least, because the Spanish galleons would lumber from Mexico, uh, even crossing the Pacific, going to Alcapoco, and they come from Peru and over Panama, and then they would have this uh, seasonal fleet that was heavily armed and guarded, except they were very slow. And they would be held up in different forts like Alcapulco and uh, Havana. Um, they're still fortified if you've been to those ports. This is old Havana, 1600. And uh, the, the backwoods were full of bandits and the seas were full of pirates. So it was the Spanish response was to build these tremendous big forts and guard their gold before it went into transit. Now, you've probably all been there. These are now historical monuments. But the Caribbean has this legacy of great wealth that created great thievery and warfare and terrible things. And so it was uh, even Christopher Columbus said to, wrote to Queen Isabella 
when she s sort of filched on her promise to make him the governor of, of Cuba and the Antilles, he wrote to her, your ingratitude will bring down the wrath of heaven so that the wealth I have discovered shall be the means of stirring up all of mankind to revenge. And it was Sir Walter Raleigh who also wrote, it is Indian gold that endangered and disturbeth all the nations of Europe. And yes, it did create a great flood of wealth, all these beautiful artisan works with gold and precious jewels and things of the New World were all melted down and became the currency. And this one somehow uh, survived probably as a, as a, as a, uh, a pet of a pirate, maybe. But... Uh, this spread, the piracy overall, the wealth spread even to the English with uh, Sir Francis Drake, who of course was in charge by Queen Elizabeth I. In, Span, in Spanish, they still call him El Drake, the dragon, because he was such a ferocious surprise on his ship when he'd show up and take their fort or take their ships. This is a reproduction of the Golden Hind, uh, which unfortunately was lost off the coast of England a number of years ago. But he went on the, all the way around South America. He was the first one to note that there was an end to South America at Cape Horn. He did not go through the Straits of Magellan because that was guarded by the Spanish, but he went up and he attacked the ports of Peru. And this is his battle where he took over one of the ships and went all the way around the world. Then he teamed up with uh, Sir John Hawkins, again, a nobleman in charge by the English court, to then go raid the Spanish uh, <clears throat> ports in the Americas. So they took this uh, grand ship, uh, the J Jesus of Lubeck, actually a German Hanseatic ship, and they went down and attacked Cartagena, Colombia. The ship was there, you all remember, the fortress at Cartagena. And this was again another naval-sized battle. The pirates at this point had official sponsorship and they had larger vessels and guns and they were representing their nation. So it's sort of where privateering and piracy versus the national politics all melded in. In 1596, uh, Sir Francis Drake died of a fever and was buried overseas, and that's his drum on the left side, which was in back in Plymouth. He used to make sounds when England was in danger, if anybody knows the story. But they've recently found the wreck, and they believe they found his um, lead casket under the water off the coast of Panama. Well, then everybody else was getting in on the act differently. Uh, the French came into Florida to challenge the Spanish reign, and uh, they built Fort Caroline, which was then attacked by the Spanish. Now, this is what happens is that when they had these kind of battles, the losing side would often disperse, and they go to attack somewhere else. They gather more um, stranded sailors, and so that was the genesis for a lot of this piracy. So here is, is an English force coming and taking St. Kitts, 1625. And the, the cruelty was gratuitous. This is the old Inquisition technique of forcing a confession by hanging them by their arms. And the, the annals of this era are just full of gratuitous uh, murder and torture. Um, but when you had all of these dispersed sailors and soldiers that were stranded on these islands, they became what, what are called the, the, the buccaneers, we call them, or the uh, filibusters, which means the brotherhoods of the boots. A uh, buccaneer is actually the old story. How, how much does a pirate's earring cost? One buccaneer. Mm -hmm. no, 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 more. They got more of them, don't worry. And uh, then they made a, a bouquin as the French term for dried wild meat from the hunting in the countryside. And so you can see on the bottom of this illustration, they would hunt either the wild cattle or the wild hogs, and they would roast it up, and then they would dry it up, and that was the only real source of protein for many of the ships. They didn't know how to fish very well back then, and so they would sell that bouquin to the ships going by, and that was a source of survival for the buccaneers. And then we have as our legacy of that uh, the barbecue, which actually, again, is a French term that means de la barbe à la cue, meaning you cook the entire pig from his beard to his tail, and you made a, a you know, jerky out of it for the survival at sea and land. Well, this was also a period of slavery, and so, again, the cruelties were considerable, but when the, when the battles would go on, some of these slaves would either escape or else they'd join the pirates. So there was a group called the uh, Simaroon, who were the freed Africans that would go into the countryside and set up their own uh, villages and economy, and particularly most famously in Jamaica, they held a whole central region of 
Jamaica and then fought the English and fought everybody and maintained their own independence. But some of them would go to sea and join what was the rabble pirate society. And in this case, they're forcing somebody to join. Either you, you become one of us or we'll cut your arm off. The greatest value was put on sailors who had other skills, carpenters, navigators, surgeons, armament-capable uh, people. And so then there became a society of renegades who then had a code of honor uh, that often included uh, electing their captain, punishing equally anybody, um, not allowing any abusive prisoners sometimes, unless they were uh, particularly bad, and uh, respect for women that were captured, for instance. So these were the flags that would be the gang colors, sort of like modern urban gangs. There's uh, Bartholomew Roberts, that's my favorite one on the lower uh, left over here. That's what I fly at my pub when, I, when I'm there to get a drink, it's not, hopefully soon. And uh, so that's where our, our Jolly Roger came from, and it may have gone back into earlier times in the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean even. But these pirates had their code of honor, which meant that they had to share what they had, and they also would hide it a lot of times. Um, and so this has been called the, the kind of uh, criminal groups that then had a code of honor amongst thieves, but it became a, sort of an initiate uh, kind of a democracy. And so um, they were all free men. They were no longer under the nobles, or they were no longer serfs, or... Uh, abused sailors, they had their own what they would call liberalia and the, f and the funds to make a whole new life in the Americas. This was the pirate island north of Haiti called Tortuga where they had their first pirate town where they defended it against any raids by the Spanish or the other authorities and they would, could come in and they could do trade amongst themselves. This was described in the Dutch um, author uh, Ex Emilius, uh, in some detail in the late 1600s of these swashbuckling pirates and their, their friends, uh, the Brethren of the Coast, and as he said, they would come in after their raids and they would spend all, everything they had on wine, women, and song and squander the rest. I don't know why they didn't put it in their retirement accounts or pay their taxes like other pirates do. I don't know. Well, anyway, this was the glory of the time. What, Bit, bit romanticized, but of course the rest of the the world back then was highly constrained in some of these ways. So this was the wildest bunch in in, in the world, and of course quite dangerous on the wrong side. But but they were very uh, crafty. A few good pirates could overcome a galleon pretty re readily. These are the uh, you know the artist Howard Pyle, who painted these illustrations for Robinson Crusoe and the. Captain Blood, and all these great stories that came out of this era, true or not. But the pirates could easily overwhelm a larger force, and they were so determined and so strategic, they would come in and take a town and hold it uh, for ransom and demand more and um, take it away and come back the next year. So this was the, the terror of the Caribbean at the time. And again, they would decide what everybody's share was, and they would try to make a, a bit of a compact between themselves so they didn't fall into the usual problem of thieves of stealing from each other. Well, there are many, there's many a story of this, but the actual historical record um, notes a few of this. This was the French um, pirate, Francois Lelounois, who uh, hated Englishmen, and he once uh, uh, held an English prisoner who accused this French pirate of fighting for money, not honor. To which uh, La Luna would reply, that proves that each of us fights for something neither possesses. And uh, some of them were, again, very cruel. Here's the French pirate tearing the heart out of a Spanish prisoner. So this was kind of the anger of the times and the cruelty of the times. And then it wasn't just the men. There were a few famous women pirates, Anne Bonny, uh, and then uh, Mary Reed, who... Uh, had as her partner Calico Jack, and in this illustration from one of the stories, uh, when he was wounded, uh, she said, if he had fought like a man, he need not have died like a dog. And then she was captured and condemned as a pirate to hang, and she said, as to hanging, it is no hardship. 
for it were not for hanging every cowardly fellow would turn pirate and so infest the seas that men of courage would starve. Well, her execution was stayed because they found out she was pregnant. So then they waited so many months later and she gave birth to the baby. And when the baby was fine, they strung her up and hung her. And anyway, that's equal justice under the law. And of course, you would know the stories of Blackbird, uh, Blackbeard who uh, uh, preyed on the uh, North American coast from Florida up to the Carolinas. And he had this terrible countenance with a kind of Rastafarian beard. And he lit fuses in his, um, his beard so they'd be ready to fire over and over again. And he practiced on a ship by setting off smoke bombs and having his men fight in the, in the fog of war, literally. So he kept escaping and beating all the police and marine forces that were after him until he was finally cornered at Ocracoke and his vessel was captured and he died with many, many wounds all over him, but he was a kind of a, a monster of his time. But now he's an archaeological phenomenon because they've found the ship and have a lot of the evidence from his time. Well, the greatest of all the Caribbean pirates was Henry Morgan, who again was one of the uh, leaders of pirate bands out of Tortuga and then finally up in, 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 uh, in Nassau and what's now the Bahamas. But he was in charge with attacking the Spanish again. They went back to um, Cartagena. They were given large Royal Navy ships and they went down and had the classic hand-to-hand -hand combat and bombardments, first at Maracaibo in Venezuela, the Great Lake, and then uh, on to Cartagena again. So these, this again was large, let's say more military operations, not just raiding, but uh, he led his force, which has had some 50,000 soldiers on it and dozens of big ships. And then he marched across the Isthmus of Panama and attacked the city of Panama. And then he sacked it and uh, laid waste to it. And this is still remembered in Panama. If you go there south of Colón, on the south side of the canal, they still have the remains of the cathedral that was burnt by Henry Morgan as a monument to that trouble. Well, even the, the nobility got in. This was a French nobleman who came over to join the fray, and he came with carriages and silk, silk stockings and fine dinnerware and wine and such, just sort of like on this ship. And uh, he helped attack again Cartagena again, uh, but was caught in the mud and it was, didn't, did not... Uh, was not a successful attack because you can see the fortifications in Cartagena are probably the most tremendous in all the Americas. Well, all this era came to a sudden end. One omen was the great earthquake at Port Royal in Jamaica, which was again another uh, 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 pirate lair, but it was the headquarters of Henry Morgan with the grace of the crown, let's say. Um, but the whole town fr front slipped into the water with the one great earthquake and they lost all of their bars and all of their brothels in one quick earthquake, which is a terrible disaster. I mean, uh, then uh, Morgan himself became the governor of Jamaica and he uh, lived a long life finally. But what really stopped it is the European powers finally decided this was very bad for their colonies and their trade and we, they just could not keep sponsoring raids on each other. So between the treaties of Madrid and Ritswick, they banned all private armies or, or armaments at, at sea. Um, and sponsorship of raids upon each other by all these uh, loose pirates around. But then there became an era when the governments would allow uh, what they call privateers, which are sort of like the armed merchant marine. They were out trading, but they were also were organized and capable of attacking other ships. And so this became a, a problem until the, uh, it was finally banned in, later in the 1800s. But this is the governor, colonial government of New York talking to Captain Kidd, who was a merchant man and a captain of ships out of the small harbor of New York. And he was uh, given funds to go and raid in the Indian Ocean, which he did. And he got a letter mark from, uh, from King uh, William III, which was the sort of official license to go off and uh, raid in the name of the crown or your investors. In this case, it was a commercial investment. But he went and he actually attacked ships of the 
uh, Mughal court of India, including one ship that was going to Mecca with the, the family of the Mughal emperor, emperor of India, which at the time was an a, a ally of England. And so that, in some cruelty to his own crew, he was accused of, of being outside his, his letter of mark, a pirate and a murderer. And then they chased him around. They finally caught him uh, off of Long Island, took him to Boston, took him back to London, and had a trial. And then he was uh, hung, though, as they say, he was so drunk when they took him out to the gallows that he, he, uh, he broke the rope and they had to restring him and hang him again. But before he died, he said, Beware the follies of the high and mighty and keep prudence as your cardinal virtue. Well, he was not, did not quite live up to those words, but um, his condemnation said, Therefore, let honor's path be trod that villains seek in vain to mock the sacred laws of God to give their neighbors pain. Well, it's still, his name still lives on, particularly around uh, the New York area, because he's said to have buried a lot of his gold in the beaches of whatever part of you're in, and uh, some of it occasionally turns up, so they say. But at this point, the policy changed so that, especially led by uh, Britain, the um, banning of slavery and piracy became national policy. So here are the, the Royal Navy suppressing, capturing, and punishing slave traders. Um, other nations slowly followed, uh, as we all know. But this led that, that the, the, the policy was to end this terrible tradition. And of course, it happened all over other oceans, too. So the Mediterranean had this problem for centuries, as Julius Caesar would attest, but at the same time, the uh, Ottoman Empire and the, the Barbary pirates on the north coast of Africa were a great menace led by the great Ottoman Admiral Barbarossa to attack and then capture other galleys. In the Mediterranean, because of the winds, the most efficient way for war vessels was to have slave galleys to row and ram and all of that kind of stuff. So there was a great pressure to get more slaves for, from either side to man these great things, either the Venetian one or the Ottoman ones and, you know, the, the old uh, battle of Lep Lepanto off the Turkish coast was the greatest naval battle of that era. And it depended on these slaves. So it's, uh, you remember in Ben-Hur, that scene where they're rowing and the drummer is saying, we keep you alive to serve the ship. Hmm. Well, it, the tradition continues. But all these slaves that were captured in Europe, on the, well, the south, south coast of Europe, were taken over to the slave markets of Algiers and Tunis and sold. And this one said they, they traded her for, for onions, supposedly, though she looks better than that. The problem was is that the uh, trade was so disrupted, and then when the American Revolution happened, the American trading vessels were suddenly not being protected by the Royal Navy, and so that led to battles off of Tripoli, the... Barbary pirates captured the Philadelphia, the, one of the big ships of the initial in the U.S. Navy. They burned it up, and then that led to more response and raids. Stephen Decatur led the Marines up, and this is all the hollowed from the shores of Tripoli and the battles against the Barbary pirates. And so this was sort of the battle against terrorism of the time, and coordinated effort by the European nations and the the young, then the young United States actually did occupy and suppress this piracy at that era. But it went on in other places. This is in Asia. So you have uh, um, all kinds of waterways all through Asia, all up to Japan, uh, with fleets of pirates that would go out and attack merchant vessels. And so this was such a problem that the Chinese government ordered all the ports to be put in some league or two 10, 15 kilometers inland so that there could be a warning system when they came and they were not just suddenly attacked right from the shore. And so this was a real serious problem all through the era of a European incursion also. So the Royal Navy and the American Navy, French and others came in and battled pi uh, pirates all over Asia for a, a period. Uh, this is up in Borneo, the, the Dayak people who had big fleets and vessels of their own. So this, these are often very formidable um, opponents here with blowguns and such. So this was the, uh, the trouble in Asia at the time. And this is how they handled it then. Rather than nowadays they get a warm uh, jail cell 
but th not in those days. So this is uh, what I just described, the legacies of uh, the, this age of piracy. First of all, the banning of privateer mercenaries after so much time. Um, trade agreements to s stop smuggling. Um, efforts to suppress piracy wherever it was. Uh, pacification of the Caribbean and the Mediterranean. The abolition of slavery. So these all came in hand to the point where we are now where there is legal international law about human rights and the rights of uh, everyone not to go through this kind of trouble again. And of course uh, there is problems now that I'll go on to, but the most important thing that came out of this whole era and all of the troubles of it was barbecue. So, Well nowadays we have a whole new uh, resurgence, unfortunately, in many places around the sea, and this is what I've been working with somewhat. These are off of uh, Straits of Malacca, Indonesian, um, Malaysian uh, pirates who will attack major vessels going through the Straits by Singapore. Now this one can't be all bad because he's a, he's a Yankee fan. And he's just an honest fisherman that ran out of fish, so he's uh, chasing other things. This has been largely suppressed in that area, but uh, where it's really bad nowadays is off the uh, uh, West African coast. So again, you have groups that are hard to find, they'll come out. I've been on a ship that had to veer away from a bunch of these guys. Most famously, the Somali pirates were the most brazen in the last number of years. And you already have heard a lot about this news. It's now pretty much suppressed. But they would come off this long coast of the Horn of Africa and come heavily armed with a full organization, a mothership, and then a, a, a vessels that could chase and catch up. And if you've seen the movie, the Alabama Mersk, you can see, the, see it all up front and close. And that's the kind of training that I've been through and advise on occasion. But uh, they st say there's still hundreds of sailors that are being held for ransom on the, in villages in Somalia because they are from Indonesia, India, and other African nations, and nobody's coming to pay ransom. So they're, they're sort of mixed in with the other very poor and desperate people. But what happens is that they'll commandeer a ship and they'll demand a ransom, and then that is dropped on, as in this case, and then it's distributed. So the big shipping companies find a lot cheaper to just pay them off than to organize a rescue, much less uh, give up the ship. So they get their ship back usually. Now the Chinese Navy, the Indian Navy, they're all participating in some of these raids on these so-called fishing vessels that go off and conduct these raids. Um, and they've captured quite a few, but I remember one was brought back after the uh, Alabama Merskin was adjudicated and then given a 30-year prison sentence in America. And when he came out of the courthouse, he said he, he, he was smiling ear to ear because he'd hit the jackpot. He, he had 30 years of uh, government care, whereas a lot of his other fr friends uh, back there were starving. And a lot of this is because of the collapse of the fishing industry by the international trawlers that came and take all the fish all out of Africa, and then the droughts and civil wars and all the other trucks. So, so here's again the, the, uh, the Mersk and other people being rescued. But they've also preyed on private vessels. And so I've been out in places where you were a fool not to go with full armament. This couple, the Chandlers, some of you may have read the story of they had their retirement yacht and they went down toward the Seychelles and got caught and held for over a year. And the UK government would not ransom by policy. So the family had to get together some 500,000 pounds and finally got them released. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy picked up their, their sailboat and brought it back to them. And they don't want to go sailing again. I don't know why not. But anyway, now that whole uh, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, Northern Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, they're all being patrolled by the uh, what they call UNFOR, the uh, United um, uh, Naval Forces that are rotated around different countries. But even so, this was the, la the most recent cruise ship that got attacked, the Ponon, with, with no casualties. Um, but they've been bombing other ships, and so it's still dangerous. So whenever we go through there, as you may have seen is on this ship, or we're not going this time, you will have security on the ship, um, 50 caliber machine guns, uh, trained crew. Uh, um, they'll hire security firms and bring on 
uh, personnel to guarantee the safety of the ship. But this is the, the preferred defense now. It's called an LRAD, or Long Range Audio Device, which is a high-powered uh, speaker, which has different settings that if it'll point a certain frequency in, in the water away, and if it hits you, you will go crazy in many ways. It does not harm you, but you can't think and you can't uh, operate your vessel and such. So this is a non-lethal defensive mechanism, which is standard on ships these days. Because I, I remember when we were going to arm our crew, we were protesting the fact that if you arm a crew and they don't have training, then they're all going to shoot themselves in the foot or um, not be effective. So this is the sort of thing they use, along with um, fire hoses and gels and all kinds of other defenses to keep pirates off your ship. But they're still out there, and uh, the cost has been still a big problem for the shipping industry. This is an estimate that at 7 to $12 billion a year are, is the cost of keeping your shipping safe. Well, there's other kinds of pirates these days. I'll uh, go on to what they call environmental piracy, which is the Sea Shepherd and other groups that are like Greenpeace, which is peaceful, but the Sea Shepherd took the environmental challenges to the point of ag aggressive actions against the most egregious of um, fishing, whaling, and so this is the, the first ship that Steve Irwin named by our Australian uh, friend here, uh, and they would go out and monkey wrench, it's called. They'd throw in lines to foul the props. They would uh, scuttle ships, particularly fishing ships. So they see all these ones that they had destroyed out at sea. And so they are, became a, a, a eco-pirates wanted in many nations for destruction of property and in interference with ship operations. They don't hurt anybody usually. They, if they sink a ship, they'll save everybody on it. And this was led by Paul Watson, who had been a fishing captain himself. And he said, if we don't inter by the time the international community has legislation and enforcement, the seas will already be depleted and dead. So he's led the charge and has luckily not been killed. They, the Japanese sent out snipers to try to kill him as they interfered with the, the whaling operations. So this is sort of a, a, a boiled over emotion in the sense of what are we doing with the oceans and how do you stop this? And so the Japanese and the Norwegians and Faroe Islanders, they are the ones that are continuing the taking of whales, and so you kind of wonder, well, who is the real pirate here? Is it the protesters, or is it the you know, egregious fishing industry? And the Japanese are the ones most determined, even though they, they can't even use all the meat that they harvest every year. And so this has been a, a running battle out at sea. Um, the world record holder of the fastest vessel volunteered to go chase the Japanese fleet down as they were heading down to the southern ocean for their season of, of whaling, and the, and the Japanese response was to run them down and destroy the boat. So again, the question is, who, who is the real pirate here? And if you haven't lived you, until you found something worth dying for, for, well, I don't know if the whales would certainly agree with that. The other piracy these days, of course, is mostly online and in media, and so I'll give it a little taste of this, just all of this piracy uh, is not as bloody, bloody as it used to be, but it's, it again has economic consequences and it kind of undermines the law and order of our societies. And then there are other pirates out there that we're not sure who they are, but this is the modern pirate ships. Uh, uh, this one happens to be owned by, I think it's Abramovich, uh, one of the great uh, Russian oligarchs, and that particular vessel uh, has a rotating lounge so that it'll always be facing the sunset no matter which way the, the vessel's going. It also has laser cannons to disable any paparazzi's cameras, supposedly, and, not, not, and plenty, plenty of other security. But they're just honest businessmen, as they are in Russia, and that's their, their, their weekend boat somewhere. So that's, uh, you know, that's where we're... <clears throat> the, the pirate is just the, uh, the one who can't afford to do legitimate business like that. And so this whole lore of uh, piracy is kind of uh, uh, both amusing and deadly serious at different places. And so particularly the Caribbean has sort of made its uh, name as the, the jolly pirate uh, centers. 
with all kinds of boats and rides and uh, lore around it, and uh, of course the uh, the required drink. Uh, and so the the tradition goes on, and so you you sort of wonder why does every kid want to be a pirate? Well, because it's so stylish and exciting to oh, disobey and go out and be free and um, not have to study and go to bed on time, go to school, all, all those silly things. So, so this is the, uh, the dream of many a child. I mean, I, I wanted to be a pirate. I really think I should have wanted to be an astronaut, but I, I missed that, that spaceship. But, but here we go. The kid says to the father, but daddy, I don't want to be a pirate. And the father says, shut up and drink your rum. So this is our motto these days. We're, we're going to surrender ourselves to the land sharks tomorrow, so hide your booty. And then if you ever come to my waters, you can come out on our very own pirate ship, which is an, a, an old uh, English Channel ferry yawl that used to work out of the Isle of Jersey. And um, in all honest business, but it happens to be the only operating little ship from the evacuations in 1940, not at Dunkirk, but at uh, the Samalo and the Channel Islands. And so we've recently donated it back to the Jersey Heritage Trust. With Those are the websites that describe the vessel. We found it sunk on the Connecticut River, raised it up, and as a community project, restored it and got it sailing around again. And we, we have offered to sail it back to the UK, but um, I'm too busy. To, I don't know why I can't... Uh, take the time off to do that, but uh, if you come uh, uh, to New York, you can come and visit and we can go out on that, but, but you have to bring rum and water, but uh, that's our motto. The beatings will continue until morale improves. And so this whole uh, era of uh, piracy is hopefully just for fun, and so I'm going <clears> to <throat> ask you to sing along with our dead men here. Uh, how does it go? Fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. A drink and the devil was done with the rest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. The mate was fixed by a bosun's pike and the bosun brain by a marlin spike. And Cookie's throat was Mark B like. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. It's been gripped by fingers ten. And there they lay, all good dead men, like break a day in a boozing ken. Yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Oh, that was well. We'll 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 we'll, we'll practice for tonight's show. But meanwhile, I'm going to leave you a couple of sayings for this great cruise and getting to know you and being up here with all the other people speaking and all the talent on the stages. But uh, this, is, this is just a couple of thoughts from the Mediterranean for your onward journey. The land divides, yet the sea connects. And another one, the Latin version, though it goes back to Greek, uh, those who run across the sea cannot change their soul. All the more reason to take another sea day and take your time to prepare yourself for land. And then, this is my favorite, it's actually a Phoenician saying. The time you spend at sea does not add to your age. And with that, I wish you a good trip home and safety at sea. Thank you very much.